Hello everyone, I'm Ashley at the Silver Bay Public Library and I'm here to read. This will be our uh, weekly story time and I am so glad that you've decided to join me. Our first story of the day is going to be Baby Bird by Joyce Dunbar and illustrated by Russell Cato. So let us begin. We're going to jump right in so that you can hear all the lovely stories. This is the bird that climbed out of the nest and flop, flop, flop. He fell. Silly bird. This is the squirrel that sniffed at the bird that fell. This is the bee that buzzed around the bird that fell. This is the frog that hopped over the bird that fell. Oh, this is the cat. Looks like the cat's stuck in here. This is the cat that stalked the bird. Oh, he looks kind of angry. And fell himself. Silly cat. Which was just as well. This is the dog that opened wide and a bird that nearly walked inside. A baby bird that wanted to fly up, up above, up above in the sky and thought he would have just one more try. This is the bird that flew. So despite all the obstacles, this little birdie still flew around. And that was Baby Bird. Now, don't fret, we still have many more stories to read, but I will say goodbye to our animal friends for the time being, and they can go play with Baby Bird in the forest. So. We have qu quite a few stories about animals today, and our next one is called Verdi by Janelle Cannon. It's a snake. So let us begin. On a small tropical island, the sun rose high above the steamy jungle. A mother python was sending her hatchlings out into the forest, the way all mother pythons do. Grow up big and green, as green as the tree leaves, she called to her little yellow babies as they happily scattered among the trees. But Verdi dawdled. He was proudly eyeing his bright yellow skin. He especially liked the bold stripes that zigzagged down his back. Why the hurry to grow up big and green, he wondered. Maybe some of the older snakes in the jungle could tell him. Verdi ventured into the treetops to look for them. Umbles, Aggie, and Ribbon were lazing on some branches nearby. Verdi peered at their droopy green bodies. It's not polite to stare, chided Aggie. Umbles burped and groaned. <sighs> it's taken nearly four weeks for that last lizard to digest. I surely do like lizards, but lizards don't like me. Why don't lizards like you? asked Verdi. Don't interrupt. Umbles grumbled. Dear me, whined Aggie. If I don't shed soon, this itchy skin will drive me bananas. Verdi tapped a tune with his tail as he waited to speak. Stop that, Verdi. It makes me nervous, Ribbon complained. Besides, you'll never grow up to be properly green, always interrupting and constantly fidgeting. Verdi couldn't imagine being in such a hurry to be like them, and he really wanted to keep his sporty stripes. Hoping to find snakes that weren't so boring, Verdi slipped away. Dozer was snoring in a tree not far from the others. Hello, said Verdi. Do you want to climb trees with me? I'm tired, Dozer growled. Go do a few laps around the jungle, okay? Verdi's heart sank. 
Greens were not only lazy and boring, they were rude. At the top of a very tall tree, Verity gripped one branch with his tail and another with his little snake jaws. I will never be lazy, boring, or green, he thought. I will jump and climb and keep moving so fast that I will stay yellow and striped forever. Then, Verity let go. Ooh. Flying through the sky. As he goes. From a distance, the greens watched. Oh my, they chorused. Ribbon shook his head. At this rate, he'll be lucky to make it to his first molt. Eggie nodded. He's likely to put an eye out on a branch. Umbles moaned. He may not live to turn green. You can see him flying through the air as the other snakes watch. But one day Verdi's skin began to peel, revealing a pale green stripe stretching along his whole body. Hack! He gasped. How can this be? I'm the speediest snake in the jungle and I'm still turning green. He raced down to the river, grabbing up a mouthful of rough leaves. Verdi flung himself into the water. If I can't get this green off, I'll scrub it off, he thought. His frantic splashing caught the eye of a large bottom feeder, cruising the murky depth. Yum, the old fish hummed. Lunch. Before the fish could haul Verdi under, the frightened snake bit him on the nose. Ah, poof! With a blast of his rubbery lips, the great fish sneezed, sending Verdi into the air. Slapping onto the soggy shore, Verdi skidded out of reach. Phew, that was close, he sputtered. Every inch of his body was covered with wet, gloppy mud. Hmm, kind of lumpy. Kind of brown. It sure beats being green. He left the mud on. But the soft, brown mud dried into a hard gray shell, and Verdi could barely move. If he even budged, the stuff cracked off in a jagged chunks. As each piece fell away, Verdi could see that his body was even greener than before. This is terrible, cried Verdi. He pictured himself hanging around in droopy lopes, itching and complaining and worrying all day like the old greens. He looked up into the sky, where the sun blazed, a beautiful yellow, just the color he used to be. Then he pulled a vine to the top of the tree. Launching himself from the treetop, Verdi startled a flock of colorful birds. Um, he became dizzy with delight, sure the bright sun and his lofty speed would turn him golden again. In his joy, Verdi forgot he would fall back to earth. Doing loop-de-loops in the sky. whoop dee whap dee wham Plumbing through the trees, Verdi landed in a crooked sprawl across a log on the forest floor. He couldn't move. Help! He croaked. As usual, the greens had been watching Verdi's antics. They moved quickly to where he lay. Didn't we say it would come to this? Umble said, shaking his head. Aggie sighed. Lucky thing he's still got two good eyes. They gently lifted Verdi up to a safer place where they could watch over him while he healed. Neatly splinted to a branch, Verdi had no choice but to listen to the greens as they gabbed. Remember how I used to streak across the forest floor? Forest floor, <laughs> Ribbon asked. Quick as lightning, answered Aggie. And I climbed giant trees like they were nothing. They grew taller than, you know... The things I dared to run down and swallow, Ubbles bragged. Wild boar were no match for me. Verdi was astonished. You used to run and climb and hunt giant pigs? What happened? Ribbon crashed, just like you, Eggie replied. I took a terrible fall, put an eye out. Then old Ubbles here nearly choked to death. Now we all prefer the quiet life, a warm perch, a little sunshine, and an occasional good meal. The greens rambled on about the days of glory, and Verdi settled in on his branch. Finally, one afternoon, Umble said, Looks like you are ready to go again. He carefully untied Verdi from the branch. You are welcome to come with us, said Aggie. Reuben agreed. The three greens slipped quietly back into the forest. 
Verdi wasn't ready to join them. He wasn't sure where he wanted to go, so he just stretched and stayed put until the sun went down. He listened to the forest come alive. With all these beautiful animals. Oh, that's a cute guy. Time passed. The sun and moon took turns in the sky. Verdi marveled at the full, as the full moon grew thinner every night. Then he watched patiently as it slowly grew round. He wondered why he hadn't noticed that before. Verdi became so green that he blended perfectly with the leaves. He was so still that other creatures walked right by without seeing him. One fine morning as Verdi basked in the sunshine, two small yellow snakes approached. They tapped and fidgeted as they started. Get a load of that old green guy, one of them whispered. Do you think he ever moves? The other snickered. I seriously doubt it. They're just like I used to be, thought Verdi, and I'm, na and I'm now what I was afraid to be. He looked at his big green body and slowly smiled. How would you like to climb trees with me, he asked. With you? The yellows were astounded. I'll even show you my fancy figure eight, Verdi replied, though he was a little worried about putting his eye out. With practice, the three snakes performed a perfect triple figure eight. Leaping and looping with his little striped friends, Verdi laughed. I may be big and very green, but I'm still me. And that was the story of Verdi. Our next story is going to be a bit sillier and have some relation to northern Minnesota here. This one is called, Have You Ever Seen a Moose Brushing His Teeth? You may have seen some of these guys wandering throughout the forest, though maybe not with a toothbrush. And this is by Jamie McLean, with art by April Goodman Willie. Let us begin. Have you ever seen a moose brushing his teeth? You will knee slap and toe tap in true disbelief. It's a sight like no other, so it's been said. Three times a day, and then right before bed. That's a lot. Now why should a moose need dental hygiene? There's a lot more to it than shiners that gleam. Because with twofers like mooses, it goes without saying. Slurping gallons of leaf juice means big time decaying. Armed with his toothbrush and sparkle moose paste, his moose floss and towelsies, there's no time to waste. His smile's gone lifeless and he's feeling quite low. His teeth have turned green. Oh, where is their glow? Determined and eager, he's off on his way to care for his pearlies and stop the decay. At break speed, he dashes round flowers and trees, hurdling fences and bush bushes and all that he sees. Just as the stream comes clear into view and he's dreaming of twofers that look just like new, he hears a big crash, a rustle, and boo! It was Ernest the Eagle from out of the blue. Moose swerves hard to miss him, but at his great gate, missing Ernie the eagle, well, it was too late. Wing and then antler, antler then wing, rolling and tumbling, that had to sting. Then when you thought there's no way, they will stop. Untangled they were on the stream bank, they flopped. Moose sat for a moment, then brushed himself off, gathered paste, brush, and floss, and up he did hop. He moved to the water, his talisies in tow. This is serious business, I want you to know. He moved his head up, and he moved his head down, till the perfect reflection was finally found. He parted his lips, and his two furs escaped. With leaf juice and hay, they were thoroughly caked. They needed some luster, sparkle, and shine. It isn't too late, but it will take some time. I will look it in there. His favorite toothbrush was pink polka dots. His sparkle moose paste he piles on top. He opens his mouth, he opens it wide. On goes the paste with lots of fluoride. He starts at the back with a slow, gentle motion, then moves to the front to start the rotation. To the front and the back, then up and then down, all you can hear is a bristling sound. He brushes and brushes and brushes some more. I started to wonder if his gums would be sore. But brushing, you see, is his favorite thing. 
so much, in fact, that he started to sing. Oh my. I'm a moosey brushing away, trying to get rid of my nasty decay. When I began, my teeth had the slime, and that is why I am taking my time. I brush to the left and I brush to the right, so when I'm all done I will have pearly whites. He brushed and he sang, and the paste foam it grew, and it grew and it grew and it grew, 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 grew. I think that he used too much sparkle mousse paste. He shook his head hard, first to and then fro. I thought for a moment, it's starting to snow. Hold on. For the paste foam you see, that had lathered his face, went airborne and quickly covered the place. I thought that would do, he was clean in a flash. But I looked on in wonder, and I heard a curse splash. Face down in the water, only antlers in view. Now came the rinsing. What was he to do? I heard him slurp in, and his slurp was a cinch. It lowered the stream by about a whole inch. Oh my. He gurgled and gargled, and he rinsed and he spit. After minutes of rinsing, he finally quit. As soon as the paste was free from his mouth, he sat on his hiney and got the floss out. Oh my. He pulled on the string, and round hooves he did wind. He tugged it real tight till it started to bind. Down and up went the floss, each tooth he did hit. Tiny leaves, hay, and grass he managed to get. He looked in the stream, which he used for his mirror. With his lips sealed up tight, he cautiously peered. He started to smile. Would his teeth now be white? He covered his eyes. The glare was too bright. The secret, you see, to avoid the tooth slime is to brush, rinse, and floss after each moosey mealtime. Moose gathers his toothbrush and sparkles moose paste, his moose floss and towelsies. He's feeling first rate. Down the path he is headed, he has moose chores to do, and he knows that his brushing was long overdue. He'll return to this spot to ward off the decay by brushing his twofers at least four times a day. Have you ever seen a moose brushing his teeth? You will knee slap and toe tap in true disbelief. It's a sight like no other, so it's been said. So be sure to brush after meals and before bed. And that was, have you ever seen a moose brushing his teeth? I haven't. We're actually going to take a bit of a turn for our next book, and this is about somewhere else. This is called The First Tulips in Holland. Do any of you know where Holland is? I'll give you a hint. It's over in Europe, so across the ocean. Most people think that tulips have always grown in Holland, but that is not true. Tulips first grew in a country called Persia many, many years ago. There they were admired by a Dutch visitor named Hendrik. No one knew the name of the flowers, so Hendrik called them tulips. Tulips is the Turkish word for turban, it's on your head, which is a sort of hat he noticed Persian men wearing. They looked as if they were the same shape to him. Hendrik brought some tulip bulbs home to Holland as a present for his daughter, Katrina. She planted them in pebbles and watered in a big blue bowl and put the bowl in front of a window where it would get the most sunlight. She's gardening. After a few weeks, little green shoots came up through the pebbles. Soon, they grew taller. Naturally, since the bowl was in front of the window, many people saw it when they passed the house. Everyone became interested in watching the green shoots grow day by day, especially since it was winter and the city was gray and drab. Katrina watered the shoots every morning, and each time she did so, a nice young man who was on his way to work smiled at her. By the time the shoots had stems and had grown small green buds on top, Katrina had begun to smile back at him, and soon they were waving to each other as well. When the buds grew bigger and more people stopped to stare into the window, no one had ever seen such plants before, and they were curious to see what they would look like when they bloomed. 
just before spring, the first bud opened into a lovely red tulip. A few days later, there was suddenly a yellow one, and the next day a purple one. Soon all the tulips bloomed. When they bloomed, they got taller. Now the word spread throughout the city about the wonderful tulips. Merchants came, housewives, students, officials, doctors and lawyers. Everybody came. Even the great Prince of Orange came to see the tulips. When Hendrick's neighbor saw how famous Hendrick had become because of the tulips, he offered him money to sell him one. But Hendrick refused. Another neighbor offered him some hand-carved furniture for a single tulip, but Hendrick refused as well. One morning when Hendrick, Henrik, sorry, saw the prince looking into his window admiring a new white tulip, he came out of his house and offered to give him a bulb. It will bloom for you next spring, sire, he said. How extraordinary, the prince exclaimed. And it will multiply, so that in time you will have several tulips, Hendrick said. When the world, when the word spread that there would be tulips in the royal garden, everyone wanted one. Complete strangers came to Hendrick's door to offer him large sums of money and all kinds of gifts if he would part with a single bulb. He was offered new horses, fine jewelry, a harpsichord, which is kind of like a piano, and, e and even a herd of cows and a flock of geese. But each time, he refused. And the flowers... After the flowers had withered away, Katrina took the blue bowl out of the window. Now the nice young man couldn't wave to Katrina every morning anymore, and he missed her. Katrina missed him, too. Sometimes she would peek through the window to see if he was passing by. One day, the young man knocked on the door and asked Hendrick for his daughter's hand in marriage. When Hendrick saw that Katrina loved him, he asked, How will you provide for her? The young man, whose name was Hans, said, I grow flowers and sell them. In fact, I first noticed your daughter because of the way she watered the tulips so carefully each morning. Since Hans was a florist, Henrik gave Katrina a dowry of tulip bulbs. Hans knew how to care for them, and within a few years they had multiplied by hundreds. Oh my, look at the field. In time, he grew so many that each spring his garden looked like a brightly colored striped carpet. There were tulips of every color and kind. There were so many varieties that it was hard to choose the prettiest. Now, there were enough tulips for everyone. There were even enough to sell to people in other countries. Tulips soon became well known all over the world as Dutch flowers. Today, everyone who visits Holland in the springtime can see a bowl of tulips in the front window of every house, and a bed of tulips in every garden, no matter how large or small it is. And that is the story of the first tulips in Holland. So I hope you guys learned something interesting from that one, because even I didn't know it. Now, I'm sad to say this is going to be our last book for this story time. This one is called Hummingbird, which you can see a lot if you look outside your window. It's by Nicola Davies and illustrated by Jane Ray. Oh, look at all the pretty birds. Granny is in her garden with her granddaughter. Keep still, she whispers to the little girl, and they'll come. The child holds her breath, and they do come. Their feathers flash in a slant of light. Their wings make the sound of their name, beating fast as thought. They'll soon be gone, Granny says, flying north like you. The little girl looks so sad. So Granny kisses her and says, Maybe they'll visit you in New York City. Later on the plane, the girl wonders how something so small could fly so far. Down on the dark sea, a sailor has company at last. A hummingbird is sleeping in the rigging. Oh, right there. At dawn, it wakes up and flies away, tiny and fearless, heading for the land. Out on the veranda, everything is ready, the nectar feeders are filled, and tiny flies buzz in the bug dispenser. Just after dawn, the hungry guests arrive for breakfast. The sisters laugh as they remember how their dad used to say, Hummingbirds need meat and potatoes, same as we do. 
spring sweeps up the country. Flowers open, bee balm and scarlet sage, trumpets, hu trumpet, honeysuckle, and cardinal flower. Insects zoom. The hummingbirds ride the green wave, zigzagging from one pool of buzz and blossom to the next. A young man sets aside his school books when a hummingbird won't share flowers with a bumblebee. He laughs aloud and texts his mother a photo of the little bird, too angry for its size. This family leaves their dinner on the table and goes outside to see hummingbirds sipping from the feeder they made out of a plastic cup and filled with sugar syrup. Hummingbirds know exactly where they're going, and when they get there, they settle in. The male chases other hummingbirds away so that his family doesn't have to share the nearby flowers. The female makes a nest with lichen, spider silk, and thistledun. It holds her two eggs tight but stretches as the babies grow and grow and grow.